going on guys it's nick here back with another video it's saturday it's time to look back at the last week talk about the most important news out of training camps i record this on thursday each week so anything massive that drops between thursday and upload all pin as a comment anything smaller we'll talk about next week's video gonna be a long one sit back hit the like button let's start things off with the atlanta falcons where we don't have much as per usual from atlanta uh london apparently had his best practice the other day uh he's been a monster deep downfield this jives with the reports that atlanta is finally going to look downfield this season finally going to push the ball deep downfield consistently that's something they have not done in recent seasons i do really buy into them being a much better offense this season i'm going to be really sad if they end up being bad again in arizona uh dorch is getting his normal hype uh, he's truly going to be a really strong late round pick this season. I think the biggest news though is around Trey Benson though. Um, it's not that he's been bad in the preseason. He's been totally fine. I just think we're maybe overrating what his role is going to be in year one. I do believe that he's like the handcuff for James Conner. I believe that they view him as their next James Conner, you know, in 2025, 2026. But He's basically the first handcuff off draft boards after Blake Corum. Seems a little bit early for what his actual role is. We thought that he'd like see the field immediately. That was the main appeal of Trey Benson was that he's going to be on the field, right? He's going to have this passing down role. And if he plays well, he can kind of carve out more of a 1A, 1B situation, him being the 1B. Doesn't seem to be the case. Seems like he is the direct backup to James Conner and only really sees the field in any meaningful way if it's a blowout or if James Conner gets injured. And if they're going to have Dean Mercado, Michael Carter, those two kind of mixing in on passing downs and two-minute drill, and that's not going to be Trey Benson's role. So if that's the case, he's going way too early in drafts right now. Um, yeah, if he's going to have zero upside if Conner does not get injured, then what are we doing, right? We can't be taking him too early. Uh, easy fade for his ADP right now. In Baltimore, only news we have is that Mark Andrews, again, he had the car accident last week, um, hasn't practiced since then, but John Harbaugh said it's a minor injury, nothing to worry about. I do believe him. It'd be kind of a weird thing to lie about. So even though he hasn't practiced yet, I think he's going to be good to go. It's not like they need to play him in the preseason at all anyways. So don't worry about that. But obviously it'd be nice to see him in practice soon. In Buffalo, I've uh, got two things. First, Ray Davis is, I think, pretty clearly, they're kind of talking about other backs, kind of mixing in, but I think he's pretty clearly the handcuff, the second back to James Cook. Um, probably not going to have a very strong role. And obviously, you know, when you've got Josh Allen being the actual goal line back, when you've got James Cook getting most of the workload on the ground through the air, the actual role to start the season for Ray Davis is not going to be that strong. You're going to look at it and be like, we only had a couple touches. Why did I draft him? Um, it's really just a, I think he is a premier handcuff. I think he is someone that like is going to have a monster role if James Cook ever did get injured. So if you draft James Cook, I would be drafting Ray Davis. I do also worry just a little bit about Ray Davis just like slowly eating into the workload for James Cook because it's very important in that like Cook kind of needs not a featured role, but a close to featured role to be any good in fantasy because like I said, Josh Allen's the real goal line back and it's not like he's going to have you know, 80 receptions this season, you know, he could legitimately have two, three rushing touchdowns. So he needs those receptions. He needs a lot of work on the ground. If you have Ray Davis coming in um, because he's good in pass protection, sometimes on third downs, cutting into the workload there. If you have him coming in, my goodness, near the goal line, that would be terrible, right? For James Cook, you'd have like zero rushing touchdowns this season, unless he scores from like outside 30 yards. It just introduces a little bit more risk I don't think he's a bad pick. He's just not a pick I've been making a lot recently. The other news is the continuation of this like Keon Coleman discussion from last week, kind of talking about like, I don't, don't know really what to do with Keon Coleman. I came out and said, you know, when we were doing like these prospect profiles back in May, that my concern with Keon Coleman was that he's not a separator. He's not someone that wins through route running. He's someone that won through physicality in college. We hate those players in fantasy because it's like, you can do that in college because a lot of the people you're going against won't even make the NFL. Everyone in the NFL is good. You can't really win with physicality unless you're like DK Metcalf, something like that. You know, you're in like that tier of physicality. And so the question has been, is it going to matter with Keon Coleman that he's not separating? Because I don't think Shakir is going to command a massive target share. I like Curtis Samuel. I think they'll scheme a lot of touches, but I don't think he is going to command a huge target share as well. 
So I think there's a pretty clear path to Keon Coleman getting the most targets on this team. And even if he's barely open, Josh Allen's good enough to kind of get him the ball. So it's kind of been like a push and pull there of like, I think he's overhyped as a prospect, but I don't know how much it matters being on Buffalo. Uh, the reports this week are that he's not separating, right? And that it could be a problem early in his career that, you know, he's going to have to kind of learn how defense is going to play him. Uh, he's not going to get all the calls right away because rookies aren't going to get a ton of these calls uh, for like officials getting like pass interference and stuff like that. So it's a concern. It remains a concern. I think he's still fairly priced. I think, you know, it's not like he's going in like the fourth or the fifth round. So for where you're getting him in drafts, I think it's totally fine. Um, I just, I truly don't know. Uh, in my opinion, it's like, if you're playing underdog, get close to the field. Like, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to like not take a huge stand either way. If you're in a couple leagues and he happens to fall in one of them, why not take a shot? Because again, he could be the number one wide receiver on Buffalo. I wouldn't go all in. I wouldn't completely fade him. But what I do think is that it's really just more assurance for me be all in on Dalton Kincaid. Like, I really think Dalton Kincaid is going to have a strong season because if there is this chance that none of the wide receivers in Buffalo really stand out in any way, that they all have a role, but none of them are even coming close to approaching what Stephon Diggs was doing, maybe that just means they're peppering Dalton Kincaid with targets. He's being used a lot in the red zone now. That was the one thing he needed to do last season. I think the real takeaway, again, be all in on Dalton Kincaid. In Carolina, we got a bunch of news around uh, Deontay Johnson and almost none of it matters. So he has the minor groin injury. He's out for a little bit of time. Then he returns. He leaves practice basically immediately with like a minor foot injury or something like that. But then it's reported that he's sick. So who knows what's happening there. But the latest report is he just had a little bit of an illness. They think he's going to be good to go. They're hoping he can play a little bit in the preseason game this weekend. If they're hoping he can play a little bit there, they're not concerned about the illness or any of these injuries. It would be nice to honestly see him go out there, command a few targets on like two drives and then leave healthy. That'd be really nice to see, but uh, that'll be, I believe it's a Saturday game. But don't quote me on that. It'll be sometime this weekend. Check. See what happened in that game. I uh, know the news there in, in Carolina. In Chicago, uh, nothing new, uh, but more confirmation that like you can't draft Cole Clement or Gerald Everett this season. Like unless you are in a deeper league, it's had a premium league where, you know, you want to take a shot on one of them getting hurt basically. They're going to rotate in. Um, you would need, given all the turret competition, you would absolutely need one of them to just be the clear tight end, and that's not the case. Uh, you need one of them to get hurt right now. If they're going to rotate, you can't draft either one of them. In Cincy, as of recording this, again, Thursday afternoon, uh, Bengals have not given Jamar Chase a new contract. The expectation is that he will not play without a new deal. This is a unique one because uh, management has also said they don't like giving players new deals when they have two years left it'd be a different situation if chase was on the final year of his contract he's not he does have two years left on his deal um i do think they're going to eventually give him one uh every day that this saga goes on though i of course get a little bit more nervous my opinion is that they are going to get a deal done before the season starts but anyone telling you that they know what's going to happen is lying to you no one actually knows what's going to happen here if you're drafting this weekend and you're entering your draft and you still don't know I think if you want to de-risk the situation and you want to take Jefferson, you want to take Amon Ross St. Brown over him, move him to clearly eighth on this top eight players, sure. Absolutely fine going for that. It's not like Jefferson and Amon Ross St. Brown are bad players. They're fantastic players. You'll still be very pleased with their production. And so if you don't want to take that risk, move him to eighth. I would not move him past eighth. I would not take Garrett Wilson. I would not take AJ Brown over him. Um, depends on the format exactly where you want to go with like within that. But again, I think if you want to de-risk, put him over there. Um, other thing there is maybe this gives you even more confidence in taking like Bijan or Brees ahead. Um, if you want to like, you know, you were hesitant on exactly where you want to take those two running backs. Maybe this is just you saying, okay, well, they're not holding out. They're still very strong picks. Give him a strategy. You want to move them over. I think that's fine as well. Um, but again, I think my lean is he's going to sign the new contract. In other news, um, a little bit of hype around Kaseki, um, some negative news around Jermaine Burton. I do think that Kaseki is like a strong late round flyer at tight end with the understanding that like you're obviously taking on a ton of risks that like he's never really reached his full potential and he could easily flop. He could easily go out there and have like a 6% target share, never be someone you trust, occasionally score a touchdown, but like you could never actually put him in your starting lineup. He could be on free in all leagues by week four, week five, um, but... If he does come out and he has got 10, 12% target share, 
maybe is someone you can use kind of a flyer there. Uh, so I think worth a shot, but only for double dipping and only late. And then the Burton negativity, I think, has gotten a little bit out of control. The talking heads are saying that Eric All is going to have more receiving work. Like, I think Eric All is an interesting flyer super late in Dynasty or something like that. Like, I think they do like him. But Burton obviously has more upside there. I do believe that Burton is going to get off to a slow start. Um, I think it honestly, though, like, you could probably leave him on free agency. Like, in a regular, let's say, 14, 15, 16 round redraft league, we got like 10 or 12 um, teams. You've got like five to seven bench spots. You probably don't need to draft Jermaine Burton, but if you wanted to use him as your last pick, go for it. Um, I would say if he doesn't get drafted, we're definitely keeping his name in mind because if he actually does go out there in week one and he plays like half the snaps and he looks half decent, he is someone that I think can ascend quickly can, you know, once he figures out learning the playbook, I don't know how he's learned the playbook yet, but learn the playbook, um, figures out how to be more consistent, earns the trust of Joe Burrow. He's got a ton of upside. So he's someone I still believe in. It's just a like, you know, definite chance that he has almost no role early in the season. Um, I think Yosevas is definitely ahead of him right now. I do believe that he's behind the eight ball, but people, you know, saying that he's cooked at this point, it's just like, we're a little pre premature there. He still hasn't played a snap in the NFL. In Cleveland, uh, and Joku has missed some practices. Um, and now Watson might not play the final preseason game where he said he was going to, but now he's not going to, uh, with just general arm soreness. Um, Judy also finally looks healthy. He looks good, but how, how like long can he stay healthy? I'm not worried about Njoku. Um, be nice to be practiced, but we're far enough away. They don't seem concerned. I don't think you're changing ranking on David Njoku. I am concerned about Deshaun Watson. Like he's not someone I draft very often. It's like, Number one, I don't know if he's good anymore, but number two, can he stay healthy or is he healthy? Like, has he been healthy at all in the past, like, three years? It's, like, it's kind of crazy that, like, we're still dealing with this injury and now he's, like, you know, not able to play in the final preseason game. So we're not going to see him at all before week one and we're supposed to trust him in a starting lineup? Absolutely not. You're not starting in week one. If you wanted to double dip late, take a shot on the upside, go for it. But honestly, there's so many quality quarterbacks. I just, I wouldn't go after Watts in the season. Um... But again, yeah, Njoku, uh, totally fine. And then uh, Judy, fine on your bench. Like, you're not starting Judy in week one as well, but he's got upside as well. Uh, in Dallas, don't really have much. Um, the exact running back split still remains a mystery. I think it's still going to be Rico Dowdle, but who knows? And I still would not draft Zeke Elliott. Um, Lamb still does not have a new deal. I maintain that that is also going to occur. I think he's going to get a new deal. He only has a one year left, so it's not as bad of a situation as with Jamar Chase. They know they can't win, right? They the Dallas knows that they're probably not going to win anyways, but that they can't win without Lamb. So it's like, what? You're just going to knock him a contract, and then all of a sudden week ten rolls around, and you're like, okay, finally we give it to you. And like now that you know you're super rusty, and we have a worse shot at a good seed in the playoffs, and we're not going to win. It's like it's just such a weird situation that it's like you know you're going to give it to him, just give it to him, right? It's not a chase situation where there's two years left. It's one year left. You're going to give it to him. Just do it. Like don't be risking time into the season, but. Similar thing with Jamar Chase. If you want to de-risk, take Tyreek Hill, who we'll get to, has a very minor injury. He'll be fine. Um, you want to de-risk, though, even more, take Bijan, take Brees. I would not go into that next tier. Like, I would, at worst, you're taking CeeDee Lamb fifth. Like, at worst, it's like McCaffrey, Tyreek Hill, uh, Bijan, Brees Hall, take Lamb ahead of that trio of Jefferson, Amon Ross St. Brown, and Jamar Chase. In Denver, uh, the only news that Bo Nix is starting, but we kind of knew that. I mean, with how much Sean Payton is in love with Bo Nix, even if he had a half-decent preseason, he was going to be the starter. He honestly looks good, though. Uh, and, and I know the team's going to be bad. Like I know they're not going to be a good offense, but Bo Nix looks decent. Um, may, maybe the offense will be okay at times. Um, I, I truly don't mind taking shots on Cortland Sutton. Um, whichever running back you like. I do think at this point, McLaughlin is the best value. I know I've been in on estimate times. I think estimate is totally fine as like, you know, a final pick on underdog, a final pick in your redraft league. But in redraft, especially, they go close enough estimate McLaughlin where I definitely would prefer McLaughlin because, I mean, he could rack up 60 receptions this season. Like he could be used as Alvin Kamara was when Sean Payton had him in New Orleans. Like, I think McLaughlin's a phenomenal pick. Um, I was definitely off him to start the offseason, but he's a great pick. Um, but if you think Javante Williams is clearly back, go for it, right? Like someone's going to emerge in this backfield and be good. Um, but yeah, I think Sutton's the only wide receiver I want. Um, take a shot on one of the running backs. Um, dual stitch, if you need a second late tight end, 
Um, seems like if he can stay healthy, he'll have a strong role in the offense. Um, but I just think everyone's just like fairly priced. No one's all in on Denver. No one thinks they're going to be good. So no one's taking any of these guys. Honestly, I think Sutton, or yeah, Sutton's the first drafted player on underdog, and he's going at like pick 95. So no one's really going that early. Take a shot, whichever one you want. In Detroit, uh, looks like Gibbs is going to practice next week. Seems like Laporta will as well. I'm not overly worried about either of these two, um, but I definitely would love to see it. I would love for both of them to return to practice next week because it would just be nice for them to get more reps for the week one. Like, I think they're both good to go in week one. It's just, I don't want them to be good to go on like, you know, September 5th. Like, I would like them to be good to go next week, have some time to practice, to not suffer a setback, and then be good to go in week one. Uh, for right now, until Gibbs does return to practice, I'm leaving Jonathan Taylor over him in half PPR and full PPR, or um, half PPR and standard. Can't do it in full PPR. Uh, Gibbs just has too much value there. But in half PPR, standard, JT over Gibbs. If Gibbs does return next week and he does not suffer a setback next weekend, I will probably move Gibbs back over JT. But until that happens, too much risk. If they don't have him return next week to practice, I'll probably just keep JT over him for the rest of the offseason. Uh, only other news is that it's basically confirmed at this point. Khalif Raymond is a wide receiver three. They are very hesitant in how much they want to use him because they basically don't think he can stay healthy and they want to use him on special teams as well. So this isn't them just being like, oh yeah, he's going to play 100% snaps on, you know, because um, they're going to run a ton of, you know, 11 personnel. It's not them saying he's going to be out there all the time. It's just them saying like, he's our, th our third best receiver. He can play all three wide receiver positions. He will be out there a lot. And I think that's enough for me to say like, you know, he's going around 18 underdog, smash that. Like if he's in round 18 and you need a wide receiver, take him every time. And Houston, uh, I think the biggest news is Damian Pierce is terrible, or at least he's terrible in this system. He needs to be traded. Um, right now, it seems like Akers is going to be the backup over Damian Pierce. I don't, I don't see why they would keep him because someone will trade. It'll be a terrible pick, but like someone will give you something for him. And if you're just not going to use him, like take the pick, right? Um, so we'll see where he gets traded to if he does. Um, but I think the biggest news is like if Cam Akers is actually the number two, Man, Mixon's such a good pick. Like, he has very clear three down upside. There's very few running backs who actually have the upside to be used on like 85% of snaps. And I don't know if that'll happen for Mixon, but like, if he was out there for 80% in week one, I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, he's pretty clearly the best running back. And this would be on one of the best teams in football, a team that's never going to have the box stacked against them, going to be winning a ton of games. So, positive game script, ton of touchdown potential, reception upside. Like, if he finishes a top five running back, I would be surprised because there's other great running backs, but I wouldn't be shocked. They'd be like, yeah, the clear feature back on Houston makes sense, right? And Green Bay, uh, offense looks great in camp. They are clicking. This is going to be an awesome team. Uh, Lloyd, though, as far as I can tell, is still not practiced. Uh, he's basically not practiced in all of camp, so he's not going to have a strong role start the season. A.J. Dillon is bad and now also dealing with apparently a re-injury of a stinger he had from last offseason that they're a little bit concerned about. It, I know a lot of you don't like Jacobs. I know that. I truly believe he's a league winner this season. With how good this offense is going to be, I don't care that the running backs didn't score that many points last season. He's going to have so many games where he racks up like 20 receptions. 20 receptions. 20 touches. He's never going to have a game with that many. But he's going to have a games where, you know, they're winning. He gets up to like 17, 18, 19, 20 carries, adds on a few receptions, you know, has work near the goal line like he's awesome and he, he's not free in drafts obviously but he's pretty discounted from where you should be able to get him my most drafted running back that'll remain all offseason in indy uh nothing new besides you know more confirmation don't take their tight ends in fantasy um one thing i would say to watch is they play tonight for me so they played um i guess a day and a half ago whatever for you guys um they play on thursday night See what happens. So apparently they've been terrible uh, on offense at times, at least this week against the Bengals in like, because you know how it kind of works is you practice against a team and then you play them in the preseason game. Just see what happens. It looks like the starters are all going to play. So you're going to see Anthony Richardson. You're going to see um, Jonathan Taylor. If they go three and out like three straight times against the Bengals and they sit their guys, like I'll be a little bit concerned and maybe we'll start to walk back some of these takes. I don't want to overact too much because it's just the preseason, but like, just watch. Just see what happens. If they lead, like, a long touchdown drive, it'll probably just be, you know, 
cornerbacks being cornerbacks on the Bengals talking trash. Um, but yeah, just pay attention. See what happens. Apparently they had a couple, rough uh, couple days in practice. Jacksonville. Uh, more hype on Tank Bigsby, on Parker Washington, uh, along with Christian Kirk, still missing time with this calf injury, likely not playing this final week of the preseason. Um, I know Tank crushed us last offseason. Um, they hyped him up. He stunk. He was like literally the worst running back in the league last season. Every report from everyone, beat reporters, players, coaches, everyone has said Tank Bigsby looks like a completely different player this season. And that Parker Washington has taken like 50 steps forward. I don't know that you're actually drafting Washington unless you're in like a 16-team league. And even then, I don't know if we're taking him. Um, but he's a name to keep in mind because it's more that it's like, okay, Kirk has his calf injury. Christian Kirk might not play in two wide receiver sets. Parker Washington's a slot wide receiver. He can kind of fill in for Christian Kirk at times. I don't know. I'm getting a little bit hesitant on Kirk. I had that video about these like five mid-round wide receivers and I ranked them last. I'm just, I'm getting a bad feeling about Christian Kirk this season. Uh, and then Etienne as well. Last season, we were concerned about the workload for Etienne. And then Bigsby was the worst running back in the NFL. And so they had to use Etienne. But they've said, they're like, listen, we do not want to do that again. They've come out and been like, I don't want to give Etienne all these touches because if he gets hurt, like, he's a great player for us. We just don't want to overload him too much. And now they're like, yes, finally Bigsby stepping up and we can use Bigsby more. And if that does happen, it's a little bit of a risk that Etienne has a, a worse workload than we're expecting. So I bumped him down a teeny tiny bit and I don't end up with him as much. Still good taking him, but little hesitation now on Etienne and Kirk. Kansas City. Uh, Worthy's been amazing. He's a phenomenal pick. Um, the running back room is a mess behind Pacheco. Pacheco is the clear lead back. So None of that is an issue. Like, he's going to be awesome this season. Get a ton of work. CEH is apparently dealing with PTSD from a self-defense incident back in 2018. You've got uh, Prince started off good, but then he's fizzled out. Same thing as last offseason, and they didn't play him last year. Uh, Carson Steele rising up the depth chart. He seems to be third right now, but is he going to finish second? I, I have no idea. Like, I have no idea what's going to happen with running back two on Kansas City right now. I just think completely stay away until we actually figure that out. But again, Pacheco is a great pick. In Rams camp, I have nothing um, tracked the Puka and the Stafford injuries, but both should be completely fine for week one. Draft them like normal. In Chargers camp, uh, Herbert is back after missing, missing some time with plantar fascia. He was in that walking boot. They just tried to get him as healthy as possible, but then understanding that he does need to like finish up camp and kind of develop these players because that's you know, a new system. He's got a lot of players there that he doesn't have a lot of rapport with. Um, apparently, first practice back, kid looks incredible. Apparently, he looks unbelievable. Um, plantar fascia is something that will linger, right? It will be with him all season. It's going to hurt. But He's a great quarterback. Um, I think he still has upside. He's not someone I probably want to draft that much in fantasy unless I'm double dipping, but find using him as a double dip option. Um, I think the biggest news is just to like, if you like someone on the Chargers and you were worried about this injury, don't be. It, it truly does seem like he's going to be fine, that Chargers players are good to go. Good news if you like someone on the Chargers. In Raiders camp, uh, Minshew on the starting job shouldn't be too surprising. He's the better quarterback. Um, it's it's good news for the offense because like he has supported fantasy relevant players in the past, um, but it's not like surprising news because again he was the best quarterback to have. In Miami, um, Tyree Kill missed practice and is wearing a brace to protect his thumb. They said they're just being cautious; it's not going to impact him at all. I wouldn't worry about it. Again, I there's more risk with CD Lamb like literally holding out than there is Tyree Kill not being healthy for Week One. He's going to be good to go in Week One. Minnesota, uh, Jalen Naylor, Kenny Wangwu. Um, Having really, really good camps, um, neither one of them are names that like you, you need to draft, right? We're not drafting either one of them unless you're in a deep league or unless like round 18 underdog, you want to take Naylor because he seems like he's going to be the wide receiver three. Um, I would just say like if Addison misses time, Naylor's the name to know. Uh, if Chandler, if Jones gets hurt, Wong was having a good camp so he can you know have a strong role if there's an injury there, but both of them are really just cases in case of injury uh, or flyers in case of injury. In New England, uh, Polk and Douglas are the locked-in wide receiver one, wide receiver two. Uh, Douglas will pretty much only play in the slot, but he'll have a very high target share when he's actually on the field. Um, for a while, it seemed like Javon Baker was going to win the wide receiver three role. He's really fallen off apparently in camp. Seems pretty unlikely right now. Maybe he's more of a long-term project for them. Um, I would really only draft Polk and Douglas. I just wouldn't draft any of their other wide receivers. Um, seems like maybe like Osborne is kind of the three to start off with, but... They really like Taekwon Thornton for some reason. So maybe he's on the field a lot. Seems like um, 
once they finally have Kendrick Bourne back from injury, maybe he's the three. So that three is going to be a rotation. It's going to be bad offense anyway. Again, Polk, Douglas, only two you want there. In New Orleans, uh, Taysom Hill continues to get hype. Um, he's being used as a goal line back, as a tight end, a fullback, a wide receiver. Like The man is literally being used how people want Brock Bowers to be used. Crazy, crazy, crazy level of usage for him in New Orleans. Um, you can't draft him, obviously, in a league where he's only eligible to be a quarterback because he's not going to outperform quarterbacks, obviously. But if you are in a league where you can play him at tight end, he's a great pick. In half PPR, I have him as a tight end 13 right behind Dallas Goddard. In full PPR, it's way lower because if his value is more like as a goal line back, as a running back that mixes in for receptions, in full PPR, that still hurts him not getting a ton of reception. So he's only the tight end 20 there. But yeah, half PPR, standard. Oh my goodness, great pick and standard. Giants camp. Um, Singletary is currently being used as a feature back. Uh, we will see how that changes once the backups are healthy because his backups are just hurt right now. Um, but he was really good last season. And then the Giants were aggressive in going after him in free agency. I know everyone loves Tyron Tracy Jr. We need to remember, he was a six-year college athlete. He played four years of receiver, two years of running back. And I know when you hear that, you're like, oh, wow, we're getting someone who was like a great wide receiver, and now they're running back, and he had a ton of receptions. His best season ever as a receiver was only 36 receptions, so it wasn't like he was that great. Uh, converted to running back, still never had more than 113 carries. Like, he had barely any usage. Then you think, he is turning 25 in November. He's a super old rookie, which also means... He was like years older than a lot of the players he was playing against in college, and he still posted pretty mediocre numbers. So I don't know. Again, everyone loves him. Everyone likes the upside there. I still think Singletary is one of the better running back picks you can make in that general range because how many running backs have a path to being featured in that range? In the entire league, really, but especially in the range that he's going in, which on underdog, I think it's around pick 110. So in a redraft league, you're looking at maybe like the 90s, somewhere around there. There's no featured running backs in the 90s. So even if it's the Giants, like if he has a chance to actually be featured, he's a good pick. Jets camp. Uh, Mike Williams might practice next week. That would be really nice to see him actually in team uh, team drills. Entire offense, though, seems like it's flowing through Garrett Wilson and Brees Hall. They're both set up for monster seasons. I have no idea what to do with Mike Williams. I've started to take some of him because it's like he's going as the 63rd wide receiver off boards. You know, when he was going to like pick 105 on underdog, which in a redraft league is probably closer to like pick 115 or so. I was like, okay, a little early because we're also like way at the beginning of camp. And it's like, I don't know when he's coming back, right? If it finally seems like he's actually going to return, then maybe he's not going to start the season good to go, but into the season. If he's going now on underdog, at like pick 130 or so, which means like one, what, 40, 145 in redraft. Okay, that's worth it to me. So I'm good taking him there. I'm good taking him at ADP on pretty much any platform. Um, I don't know how much you're going to trust him this season. And to be honest, I think he's a better pick on underdog because you can capture those weekly spikes. In redraft, it's like, how likely do I think it is you're going to actually trust Mike Williams consistently in like even your flex spot? I don't know. Like, I truly don't know. And, and maybe that's what makes him an okay flyer late in drafts. I just wouldn't go crazy and take him too early. In Philadelphia, uh, the Eagles traded for Jahan Dotson. Now, I don't think that has really any impact for A.J. Brown or Devonta Smith. If you wanted to downgrade them a little bit, you can. I didn't. I did the projections not even touching what they were going to get. Um, I think it, just, it crushes all of the wide receivers because I think they're going to basically slot them in at wide receiver three and just be like, you know what? You were a round one wide receiver. Maybe it didn't work over there. It's not like we trust our threes anyways. See what you can do, right? With with no coverage focused on you, see what you can do out there. Um, I think it's more of a hit to those wide receivers and then to Goddard. I just think this kind of like eats into his workload. Devonta Smith, AJ Brown, they're studs. They're going to be totally fine. So I didn't touch them. Uh, we'll see how the market reacts. Um, I don't think I would go after Dotson as early as he was going. So he will need to fall in drafts because like his target share can only really be so high. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. I didn't like Goddard before. I feel like I still don't like him. I've moved him down as well. I would really just stick to A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith, Saquon Barkley, Jalen Hurts. If you feel like taking a shot on a falling Dotson or Goddard, go for it. But I don't know if you really need to this season. Pittsburgh, uh, still no news on Ayuk. Um, I am drafting under the assumption that Ayuk is not going to be traded to Pittsburgh. I just don't think at this point we can 
assume that that is the case. So if you're drafting this weekend, just draft Pickens under the assumption that Duke is not going there. Um, Mike Tomlin was also asked about Jalen Warren. He said he's probably out this week, but they don't think it is a long-term concern. I mean, I just, I'd like to see him return to practice. It's good news, right? It's good news for Warren in that, like, if he doesn't think it's a long-term thing, if he thinks he could be back, be back next week, that's awesome. If he doesn't return next week, it's, like, tough. If you're drafting this weekend, it's still kind of tough to really trust that. So I would say be cautious. Don't take him ahead of ADP. Probably don't take him at ADP. Uh, if he starts to fall a little bit, if everyone's a little bit worried about this hamstring, still a great player. Um, still enough time to week one where... I think you can take him. Um, just again, don't don't take him ahead of ADP. And San Fran, uh, Elijah Mitchell is back at practice. We will see if he's able to win back that number two job from Jordan Mason. That remains a battle to watch because if one of them can win the clear number two job, that's great. I'm just getting the feeling that neither of them will win the number two job and that if McCaffrey went down, you would just have Mason and Mitchell kind of rotate in and out as a 50-50 split, which would be kind of gross and really annoying in fantasy. So I don't really know which one to draft, but right now, if you made me draft one, it is Jordan Mason because he's been really, really good with Mitchell out. Um, and then, as I said before, as of recording this, I don't know the status of Ayuk. My guess right now is that he's going to stay with the 49ers, but no one really knows there. Um, oh, and then and Pearsall um, has not returned to practice, is not going to play in the preseason. I love his long-term potential. And I think to close the season, maybe he's good. And I think if Ayuk got traded, he'd have a very strong role this season. He's still someone that, like, I'd go after him an underdog if he can fall to pick, like, 165, 170. Um, I'd be fine in redraft if you want to take a shot on him and your final pick. You have an IR spot. If he opens a season not playing, you can throw him an IR. But for the most part, in a redraft league, I don't think I'd go after him anymore, especially if you don't have an IR spot, because I truly don't know if he's playing in week one at this point. In Seattle, uh, I have nothing. Metcalf, JSN. Uh, Ken Walker, all getting a lot of praise in camp. Seems like those three are in for a big year. Uh, in Tampa Bay, also nothing new. Mike Evans uh, has been a monster this week. He's going to have another strong season. Uh, but McMillan, Bucky Irving, they continue to have strong camps. In Tennessee, uh, Tyler Boyd had a nice week. Definitely if Hopkins misses time, Boyd can have some okay games. I still just don't think there's anything here. Like Other than like a late round dart throw, but even then, like, he wasn't ever even really that fantasy relevant with Burrow in Cincy. What makes us think he's going to be fantasy relevant, even if the offense operates similarly with Will Levis at quarterback? I don't think there's anything there. I wouldn't take him. Then finally, for the commanders, uh, like I said, Dotson was traded to the Eagles. A lot of people asking what that does for um, you know these secondary wide receivers. People were super pumped about McLaurin. I think the market's going to, in general, overreact and really drive up McLaurin's price to a point where it's like, kind of ridiculous because like before Dotson was battling Tommy Brown. So we already knew that Dotson was not any sort of threat to McLaurin's target share. Now he's gone. It's like, well, he could have easily just lost that battle and everything would have been the same anyways. And to be honest, it seemed like he was losing that battle. So I didn't touch McLaurin's um, target share. Like I gave the work to Tommy Brown. They've been talking about Olamide Zacchaeus having an okay camp. So he gives him some work, um, bumps up Luke McCaffrey, gets him onto the field a little bit quicker. You want the slot wide receiver. You want the wide receiver getting those short targets on a Cliff Kingsbury offense. Honestly, I think they're just going to kind of focus on McLaurin and give him a lot of those targets. But if I had to guess, I still think Dami Brown's probably the one you want, then Luke McCaffrey, then Olamide Zacchaeus. But basically, just pick your favorite from that group. I don't think it's going to be Zacchaeus. I think it's going to be one of Dami Brown or Luke McCaffrey. Um, but they're just dart throws. They are last round picks on underdog. They are last round picks if you have like seven bench spots. But for the most part, it's McLaurin. It's none of the other wide receivers in uh, Washington. So uh, that's the biggest news from every team over the last week. If you watch this far, please leave a like. It really helps me out. Uh, and if you're new here, welcome. I've got another video dropping every single day. So why not subscribe? They're completely free. That, my friends, is the end of this one. Thanks for watching.